All right, everybody, and welcome to the Nine News Podcast, episode 255. I am Nick Draper. I am joined by the face of the BBC Sport website, Mr. Stuart Deacons. And it feels like the crossing of the finish line this week. I know last week, Stu, we knew that we stayed up. But now, now any last lingering doubts that anyone might have had of a Rochdale five-goal swing and six-point finale to the season has all gone. We are safe. We are in League One next season. And I'm just in a bit of one of those moods where you just sort of all that stress and tension is just, just slowly dissipating. And now you're having that sort of kind of quite nice feeling, but sort of relaxed feeling. A bit of a, not a down feeling, but a, you know, a bit lacking in energy almost kind of thing because you've crossed that threshold and now it's just winding down. Like the end of the day, when you get your slippers on, pick up a copy of the paper, maybe doze in front of the news or whatever it might be with a nice hot cup of cocoa. It's that sort of feeling. Just me? Yeah. Joy, it was a bit of an empty feeling. Um, we stayed up, but yeah, it worked. Hey, look, we lost a game. Um, Pompey, yeah, Pompey done a number on us and um, we lost and we stayed up. But it, it it felt empty. Um, it, it's a weird, it's been a weird season, isn't it, for everybody? Um, I think for me personally, I'm just so pleased we've kept our League One status. Um, so it means that you know when we do go back to football, um, you know us, you know last game we saw was a League One fixture against Bolton, um, and we'll, we'll see a League One fixture at Plough Lane. So that continue that continue continuous vibe or continuous theme. Um, is League One. The irony is Bolton could have got relegated and promoted again before we play him again at Cloud Lane. That's true. So they were our last opponents at King yes. Meadow. The nil-nil draw, because I remember it very well. I don't remember games very well because you know I'm old. However, it was, it was our birthday game, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> and, um, so that's how I remember it. And also Quezzy, um Quezzy had a goal disallowed, didn't he? He did. Um, I just think we could have ended the season with Crazy scoring a winner in the last game ever at King's Meadow. That could have happened. It could have happened. I know some people said that a nil-nil was a fitting goodbye to King's Meadow, but I don't agree with that whatsoever. King's Meadow was a time of unprecedented success for us as a football club. And uh, a fitting final game there would have been a comfortable 2 nil victory. But... Uh, it was what it was, I suppose. We are, as you say, safe, despite the defeat to Portsmouth on the weekend. Um, I was a bit surprised to see us concede three goals in 45 minutes, not becoming of us as of late. But, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Joe Pickett scored again, didn't he? And it was two goals right on the stroke of half-time that did the damage, really, wasn't it? Um, what do you make of it? Was it just a case of one team with something left to play for? One team, not really, and just tiredness mistakes starting to yeah. come in that sort of thing I, I felt we were mentally tired um i know robo won't use that as an excuse but we, we yeah i think do you know what i think no matter how many times people said you know Rochdale could catch you and northampton could do this you know we it wasn't mathematically confirmed after um after a game before pompey which i've forgotten already <laughs> um but yeah it wasn't mathematically confirmed um, but it was in a way, do you know what I mean? But Pompey, Pompey pushing on decent form. Um, yeah, I felt I felt against Pompey. We we got the goal. They upped it, uh, and we just uh, there were individual for me. There was individual errors, not tracking runs, um, and some decent finishes. But they were worth the win. Um, but you know, I don't know. I don't know about you, but my attention was really looking at what was happening at Rochdale and, and Northampton, and once they were losing. Um, then it was just an anti-climax, really. Yeah, I was asleep. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I woke up at half-time and I went, blimey, 3-1, what's going on? Um, but hey, as we say, it didn't matter in, in the grand scheme of things. I think Portsmouth, we beat them last season, didn't we, at Kings Meadow? Late winner, Glyn Hodges, in the first glut of games of him in charge, late Terrell yeah. Thomas header. Was that a Terrell Thomas, wasn't it? Yeah. Really we were talking to him on um, Sunday Night Live a couple of weeks while well, I wasn't, I was listening in um, and he was saying, yeah, that was the winner, the late winner uh, yeah. against Pompey. So, so yeah, 
Um, a very much a very different Pompey side now under Danny Cowley. What I would what I would say in terms of you know we've had sorry Rochdale of course was the game that yes, we yes. had before Pompey. But what I would say is that um, I think what I was going to say now. Do you know what? It's really, I feel like the just finished and it's totally gone. Um, yeah, I just we can see the goals. We look tired, um, but I think it shows a, a, there was some respect I felt given to us in terms of. We're a full team now. No one's going to come. You know, before people would come to us and probably take us on and play two up. Felt now that teams are respectful of us doing their homework. Because you look at the form table, I think we're still in the top three, four on the form table. Um, so we're getting respect. Probably come to us to do a number. So, you know, if we are going to have a decent season next season, we're going to have to remember that people are going to come to us and um, be respectful and maybe we're going to have to be a bit more cuter uh, and work harder. Yeah, I am interested to see what happens next season with since Robbo's come in charge and results picked up and made clubs, like you say, just sit up and take note of the good form we're in. I think I don't think we'll enjoy that almost, I don't want to say complacent way that teams treat us, but I think teams will adapt themselves more than perhaps they would have done previously. And it'll be interesting to see how teams approach us next season as much as we approach them and hey look there's so many unanswered questions about next season it'll be impossible to go into it now in terms of what the squad will look like where we'll fit in the budget league again which we anticipate all as always towards the bottom and uh, we'll see what the clubs coming up are going to be like we know Cheltenham are up we expect Cambridge Bolton playoffs to a bit of a lottery and then we've got big clubs coming down whichever way you look at it Um, one of or two of Sheffield Wednesday Derby and Rotherham which basically means we're guaranteed one of Sheffield Wednesday and Derby. Yeah, um, it's going to be a tough league next season. You know, Wickham will come down. Um, they would have benefited from the, the money in the Championship, the extra TV money. They haven't spent it, so you have to assume they're going to be strong next year. Um, yeah, whoever comes down, Derby or Sheffield Wednesday, um, they could effectively both come down if the results go yeah. Rotherham's way. On, on you know, There's a chance they could both come down. That would be unbelievable. Yeah, um, Bolton possibly coming up. Um, for, uh, Cheltenham. Cheltenham, not a big club, but a stable club. Um, and then you potentially got, well, Salford have uh, crept in mm. late run. If they if they get into League One, um, they will spend. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough one. Um, but what I would say, it's going to be one that's going to be good to be in. Um Although there was a bit of irony, I did think, I don't know if you noticed um, Morecambe, I think I might have said a little while ago that, you know, I don't really want Morecambe to be the first visitors to Plough Lane in a league game. I never envisaged that they could potentially be a League One fixture. Um, yeah, that sort of threw that argument out the window a little bit, doesn't it, when you say, no, could you imagine Morecambe in League Two? And yeah, it could well be Morecambe in League One. And they've done fantastically well. Very well. Be fair um, to them, especially as they were struggling for a couple of years. Yeah, I think if you think about it, Morecambe are equivalent of like an Accrington Stanley getting into League One. Yeah. You know, that sort of size club, isn't it? Um, not that I would, you know, if Morecambe was our first game at Plough Lane, they would have done, they, you know, they would have won that on merit. But I thought it was going to be a League, a league Two fixture. Um, where more likely, you know, could be a League One fixture. We, of course, shall see. Time will only tell. The Morecambe question, done and dusted, the Salford question. However, interests me greatly because they will spend money. And um, at some point, Gary Neville's got to pick a side of this where he sits in the whole football debate, doesn't he? Because he seems to be wanting to sit with one leg on either side of the fence. Um, Salford cannot be successful without massive input financially from benefactors who are not supporters. However much you might say otherwise, heart and soul ripped out of that non-league club by what's happened since they've come in and uh, it poses interesting questions I don't think he can reconcile those two things his current attitude in regards to the protests following the European Super League um, proposals and since withdrawals he can't he can't reconcile that with his own role in Salford I don't think what did you think of the protests on the weekend at Old Trafford yeah well it wasn't a surprise but um, there was, I think there were, you know, there was rumours there'd be 10,000 Man United fans, which would be a challenge 
because most of them live in Manchester and none of them, there's not 10,000 in Manchester, Man United fans, they're all City fans, aren't they? Um, but yeah, it was, I, I, I was a bit, it was a weird one, wasn't it? Because I, I got the protest, I understood it. I didn't really know, there was two things to it. You know, there was, and you know, Gary Neville was quite an interesting one because he he's got a 10% share in Salford. Um, but it was, you know, were they, were they, was it against the European Super League? Was it against the Glazers? Or was it both? It was very difficult to understand, you know, what do they want? Because you know, the problem is, if you want to get the Glazers out, they're going to have to sell to another billionaire. So, and yeah. people don't get rich by giving money away. No. So, it's, it's like, it's, for me, it's just a little bit too late. Um, it's a, we've got billionaire owners, even in, you know, even in Championship, we've got Stoke, massively funded. Um, and it feels sometimes it's a bit too late now to go where we want it to be the fans because we've, I say we football fans across the country and the world have accepted it. So I don't know what these I don't know what these um, protests are going to do. If I'm being honest with you, the the reaction. It seems if you look in the press, Gary Neville, well, Sky seemed very keen to to say that you know this was a peaceful protest with some idiots um, who got onto the pitch. But there was a mixed theme. I don't know if you read the papers, but it was a mixed theme depending on what paper you read or go in. It was a really good protest and demonstration to that's not what we want to see, you know, in terms of that was not the message and it and it's it got lost. It, yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen, you know, are we is anyone else gonna protest what they're not gonna do? What's gonna happen next season? Because it's all right, it's all right, um, boy, you know, it's all right protesting when you can't get into the ground. But are we gonna have serious protests when the season starts next year? You know, will people not buy merchandise? Because the only way you're going to get gazes out is if the profit goes. And they're not just... A, Man United are a worldwide brand. So if, for example, say, the Man United fans in this country stop buying merchandise, does that really make a difference? Because you've got all the China and Japan and Asia all buying it. So I think it's a little bit too late to do this sort of protest. It seems to be an idea that um, we can totally reform football and have the German model of 50 plus one ownership. Um, you're only going to get that if you have whole scale or whole wholesale even reform. You need or revolution. Essentially, if you want 50 plus one ownership, you're going to have to start up your own football league, start up your own new range of football clubs. You can't enforce it on what's already in place. It just doesn't work. Um, they seem to be living, if I'm being honest, in a little bit of a fancy land. That's never, it's never going to happen. And as you say, no one can afford to take on the running of these clubs anyway. I mean, Manchester United can absolutely be owned and run by the fans. That's not a problem whatsoever. But they're not going to be in Europa League finals. They're not going to be in... Champions League competitions, they're not going to be in the top four, they're not going to be challenging for silverware. And why are they in the position they're in? Because that's what the fans demand. It comes back to the same thing time after time after time. We've said it ourselves, fans will demand success. And we're no different. We've had we've had this conversation a million times. We're no different. I, yeah, no I different. feel I just like I say, the protest I don't get. What they what do they want? What you know? What is the end game? They want glazers to sell up, but they're not just gonna. The government can't just go overtake. You know, can't take over a company. They you know the glazers own it, so they got to sell it. There's got to be a buyer. That's not going to be a short term thing. Is that you know? Is the next owner going to be any any? They're going to want to make money coming into that. So I, I, I'd be interested in what the game is. But if a main United fans protesting. It's like a little bit of irony to me. They don't protest when they're trying to win things or, you know, um, by Cavani and Pogba, the money they're spending and stuff like that. If we really want change, we have to get the money distributed fairly. So it means that it actually shouldn't be the, the Premier League teams or the fans in the Premier League should be going, well, actually, we want we, we should be doing parachute payments. We should be maybe opening up the Premier League to more than one, yeah, more than three teams. Okay? The money has to drip down. The interesting thing, if you look at all the TV revenue, I was looking, I, I follow um, a, a Twitter handle called Swiss Swiss Ramble, Ramble, Swiss Ramble, does a lot of financial pictures on stuff. And when I was looking at it, 
the TV money last year, 91.6% went to the Premier League. So the rest of that, what's that, 8.4% dripped into the football pyramid, of which 80% of that money went into the Championship. So the deal the Premier, the Premier League are taking all the money from... So this is what I don't understand. Do, do Premier League fans realise the damage to the pyramid is done by their team? So if they really want reform and it to be fair, then there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen because ultimately the money is not dripping down. And I think it's a little bit of lip service when they say we are supporting the pyramid. I think if they actually saw the actual facts and, and the press and, and the journalists actually got on top of that, then we would see how unfair it is. Simple as that. It's, 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 the money in football is ridiculous, and it's just going to players. Um, as they, you've got players saying they don't support the Super League and it's unfair. They're the ones that are taking the money out of the game. You know, I, I, they own it. Well done. But does someone really need 400 grand a week, 300 grand a week? No, I mean, it, I'd say players and agents, in fairness. Um, agents are, are a big drain on, on finances. But players, no, nobody needs to earn this amount of money. We had this conversation a few years ago when um, I can't remember the cause, but there was a cause and it was well publicised and it was on TV and they wanted Premier League footballers, and I think they did it in the end, to give a certain percentage of their salary to this charity. It might have been comic relief or sport relief, one or the other, whatever it might be. And, you know, you had players, footballers there saying, well, of my salary that I get, I already give this amount to this charity and I already give this amount to that charity. You don't hear about it, but we do do it. So at least the money, there is some players that are recycling and putting that money into good causes. And obviously Marcus Rashford's won a lot of praise as well for what he's been doing. Um, but you're right. That said, a footballer, if, he, if there was turn around tomorrow and say, right, new rules of football, salary cap, no player is going to earn more than £150,000 a year, which I think is fair, by the way, to any footballers listening. I'm going to be honest, my head teacher at my school doesn't earn £150,000 a year. And I can guarantee you that he puts in more hours and more work than any footballer. And footballers can argue the toss about that one. No, you can't. You, you really can't. I'll give... I'll give them some due in terms of their payments, in terms of... Yes, every Saturday they, they are at work, as it were, inverted commas. All right. Yes, they they can't really go on a holiday during the football season. Not really. That's my plan. They shouldn't be anyway, unless they're not internationals and then they're not going to pay the big money anyway. So there are some caveats with, with the money they get. But on the whole, no, of course, they shouldn't be earning the, the, the ridiculous sums they do. It is the... Is the price we pay for living in a, in a capitalist society. This is what happens. But I think you're right about the fans. They don't realise. They don't realise the disparities. They don't realise that their drive for success. They're phoning up 606 every week, complaining, wanting managers sacked. Then saying finishing 14th in the Premier League isn't good enough and all this nonsense. Like It's a total loss of perspective. But similarly, we're all guilty of that. So the money yeah. might not drip down. As you say, the money's not coming down into the lower leagues. Not naturally anyway. Obviously, a Salford is an example of someone putting big sums in. Fleetwood, similarly. The money isn't coming down, but the attitudes are. And who are we to argue this season we sacked our manager because we were deemed to be underperforming 10 days after we were told that the manager won't be sacked and we've got a long-term plan. Yeah, and I think that's just brought up on a premiership mentality, isn't it? Because you sort of see the top clubs do it. Now, if you lose four or five games, you're under pressure. Yeah, it's ludicrous. It's crazy. It's, you know it's I mean? football. Sorry, Stu, but it's, fo it's football. Like, I'm, it's, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. I think, I think it's football. It, you remember I was saying to you um, early, in, early in the season when we were doing a podcast that it's like, in a way, we have a, we have a parallel universe where football is detached. Yeah. What I mean by that is we pay when people say when people say, well, all right, um centre of our foot Liverpool, Van Dyke, Van Dyke, Van Dyke, not really Liverpool. Um 80, was it 70, 80 million? We had 50 million for Mendy and um Walker you know, at Man City. Since 2013, Manchester United have spent one billion pounds in transfer fees. Yeah. But if we take France a right back, 
a right back. Okay, so Carl Walker, I think it was 50 million quid. If you say that, it's when you think about it, some Premiership fans or some road um, some phone ins will go, Well, I think City should spend 50 million quid. And it's said so flippantly. Yeah. So, you know, but if you actually quantify what is 50 million quid, and if you quantify, and this is why I try and say, if you quantify it for the Football League, I, 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 I think I phoned in 12BC the other week when it was about European Super League. And I said basically 50 million quid is out, it could, Wimbledon could survive 25 years on that budget, on a £2 million a year budget. Yeah. That could be our 25, that could support us for 25 years. Uh, and it's, I think we've lost sight of what this money is. You know, I think it's like a football manager. He's sort of like, it's like a football manager game where you go, oh, I'll bid 100, I'll bid 100 grand. He can have 100 grand a week. But when you quantify it, no one earns 100 grand a week. Even the Prime Minister doesn't earn 100 grand a week, which is why he had to do some, you know, well, dressing up on his on his property. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I just think, you know, it's so easy, fans. I think what happened was, is the European Super League, the six big clubs didn't want to do it because they, they missed out on their games. And the other 14, who were happy to stitch up the rest of the football pyramid, all of a sudden went, one second, that, that's not that's going to affect us. And everyone threw their toys out of Pram. Yeah. But if the Premier League are ever going to throw their toys out of Pram, then have a look at themselves. You know, they're the ones that want the parachute payment. I think I looked at so the parachute payments for 2019-20. If you look at all the parachute payments, you get year one, year two, year three. Um, last year, some of them got £15 million from, I think, year three of their parachute payments. Again, £15 million quid is, what, eight, nine times our, our budget for the year? And yeah. I think if you accumulate, I think it was close to £200 million quid the Premier League gave out in parachute payments. Yeah, it's a joke. So why could that not drown? Do they need, you know, do they need a parachute payment? It's, it's, it's like they want to look after themselves. It's like, well, if we get relegated, then at least we've got the money. If you look at it, potentially, you could have all three teams that got relegated from the Premier League the season before yeah. getting promoted. And that's all parachute money is going to help them. Which is then, subsequently, then meaning that you've got teams like Derby, Sheffield Wednesday, um, all of them spending ridiculous amounts of money to get into the, the promised land. And Derby, if you look at Derby now, Derby are now being really, in a way, punished for that, that sort of campaign. You think about it, I think they were in the playoffs, seventh, they lost out against Villa. In a way now, them dropping down into League One is because actually they've exhausted all their money chasing it. Yeah, uh, again, that all comes from pressure from the fans, if you remember. Derby oh, yeah, the had... fans are there. Yeah, the fans yeah. are there. And they were the first ones to moan that why are we going to Plough Lane when we should be going out? You know, you hear that thing, you know, out, this club deserves to be in the Premier League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who deserves to be in the Premier League? Because Bournemouth got into the Premier League. Bournemouth, so, are, Bournemouth are the classic example of Bournemouth will always wind me up. Bournemouth were one club that gambled and they, they got away with it. And then what happens is you get into the Premier League, like you say, Stu, and the Premier League doesn't say, well, now you're here, see how you get on. And if you go down, you go down. That's the end of it. The Premier League say, do you know what, guys? You spend more money to try and make sure you stay in this division you keep putting the millions of pounds in that you don't have, but don't worry, because if it doesn't work out over the next three seasons, like you said, we'll give you millions and millions of pounds to make sure that you don't fall into a lead situation from 20 years ago or 15 years ago. If you look at, it encourages it at every step. It's really interesting. If you look at QPR, do you remember QPR got into the Premier League, gambled, spent loads of money, ended up then financial fair play, got relegated, really suffered from it. The year Villa got promoted, that was a shit or bust season for them. The yeah. Americans put loads of money in, and I, I, I knew about it because um, Lorraine's um, brother is a Villa fan. And it literally was if they didn't get promoted in that playoff final, the Americans were going to take all the money out. So they gambled on that season getting into the Premier League. And if it didn't happen, they were going to take their money out. Yeah, you can't you can't have that. You can't have some team gambling that amount of money because ultimately, if they don't, and you know, I, I, I take no pleasure in Derby. And Sheffield Wednesday coming into League One, but you can see why. Although Derby, do you know what I do? You know what I'm like. I hold grudges, don't I? I don't really like Bristol Rovers fans and stuff like that. I don't really like Derby fans. It all goes back to the night we went to their new ground at Pride Park. I think we were one of the first things to play there from memory. Yeah. Uh, midweek, and the lights went out. Yeah. Uh, and they mocked us back because we didn't have a ground. Hmm. And I didn't like it. So when they come back, it'll be you know they kept saying. You know, it would be so, in a way, it would be like, well, do you know what? You've got a new ground, we've got a new ground, and we're in the same league now. Well, <laughs> yeah, fair point. Yeah, nice ground, though. Fair ground. 
great ground. Yeah. Oh, it's a lovely stadium. ground. It's, it's yeah. In the middle of nowhere. Remember, yeah. we, remember we went into those grounds, was it? Like the Boltons, the Derby. It's all built. And we used, I remember going there and thinking, if only we had this amount of free land in, in Wimbledon. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been so easy, wouldn't it? I don't know. I mean, they could just build a whole new ground in the middle of nowhere. But, um, but yeah, they could be coming down to, to League One. and I, I think they will do. I think they will do. To tie this up in a nice little package, I remember going to watch Luton play Bournemouth and uh, the game was abandoned at 7... It was a 7.45 kickoff. It was abandoned at 7.48. The teams had not appeared on the pitch. Nobody knew what was going on and it was said that due to one corner of the pitch being frozen, the game was not safe and could not be played. Immediately, all the fans who were in the stadium by this point booed, and then within five seconds, all the Luton fans realised, oh, well, we're going to walk home now, and then started mocking all the Bournemouth fans who had to travel all the way back down to Bournemouth, having seen no football. I found it quite amusing. I'm really not a fan of Bournemouth. Sorry to any Bournemouth fan listening. Um, this is you mentioned Luton. Do you know what I still remember from Luton? And do you know what? The, funny, the good thing about Luton, I know we have a bit of a laugh with Luton, but they're now, you could argue, a, an established... Championship club, you don't look at them in any trouble. Uh, they've been in trouble, no, no trouble season, and even commentary have gone up. But I still remember that playoff where they lost at home to York. Oh, and yeah, Brody, Brody was trying to avoid, um, let's just say the sweets and stuff that were being thrown at him. Oh, do you um, know what? No, I'll never forget, I was there that day as the New York City team. <laughs> oh my god, I could talk for hours about this. The York City team had to exit the, the stadium or the pitch through the back of the away end. <laughs> because of what had happened but i mean oh what a stupid situation they got themselves into so well all that right it should never have happened it was a disgrace and richard Brody should not have had coys thrown at him as he tried to leave the stand um, with his shirt pulled up over his head as if a shirt pulled up over your head was somehow <laughs> going to protect you from coins <laughs> like honestly he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer was Brody as good a player he was in the conference but why did the York the York fan, the York players? There was a pitch invasion as soon as full time. Mm. It was the, the last home game of the season, so Luton fans all, and it was all jolly and fine. They all come onto the pitch. Families were on the pitch, as you know, and the York players decided, at the site of this pitch invasion, we're not going to run to the tunnel like most normal people would. <laughs> we're going to go to the opposite corner from the tunnel and start celebrating in front of our fans. <laughs> that, that was a dumb thing to do, but that's not uh, defending. That's not to defend anything that happened after that. It's, it's indefensible. But what no. a just a crazy situation to um, but look at the look witness. at the fortunes of both clubs now. What are they four leagues apart now? Um, are York still alive? In the, well, York City in a new ground, um, and they're in the Conference North. They were looking. Oh, they were probably odds on to. I don't think they were romping away with the league, but they were probably getting the playoffs to get back into the conference. And of course, they got suspended. Um, but if you look at it, just when you, when you just mentioned Luton, then I was thinking about York. If you think about the difference now. In what ten years? Are we at ten years? Maybe something like that of, of fortunes and um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a weird thing. But Luton have done really well, and I think we should, you know, we should really model ourselves on what Luton have done. You know, average size club, you know, average city, town, city. Sorry, town. I've upgraded them, but they don't look in danger. The reason I, the reason I feel that is because I was keeping an eye on the score against them playing against Rotherham. Rotherham obviously, yeah. um, and the side's got good quality. The side's also got Danny Hilton, who we didn't think was good enough for Wimbledon <laughs> back in League Two. I think that I think there's a few players though. And in fairness to Bournemouth, this happened with them. Although Bournemouth invested a lot of money, there were players that made it all the way through their journey with them, through through the divisions that stayed with them and improved as they went on. I think Luton have got a, f- a couple of those in that squad. You look yeah. at um, Penny. Well, we signed one before, didn't we? <laughs> well, we did. <laughs> Who's supposed to be their linchpin? <laughs> we did. Well, less said about that, the better. <laughs> My word. The good old days, Kings Meadow. Do you know what you're right? Kings Meadow, so many good memories. Um, and um, yeah, yes. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to particularly miss it. However, um, I am. You know, I think I am. I'm really not. I think Do I'm going to miss the, that smell. The only time that, I promise you, the only time I've missed Kings Meadow since the last time we were there, obviously was when I was watching an old episode of This Time with Alan Partridge and he was driving down the Kingston Road. And I thought, oh, I'm never going to drive down there to get to a game ever again. Because I'm not going to watch Chelsea women because um, I hate Chelsea. So, yeah, I thought, oh. And that was about it, really. And then I realised, I'm not bothered. It looks so different now, anyway. Chelsea have literally changed it all now, haven't they? 
Um, yeah, it looks worse because it's covered in Chelsea shit now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, anyway, um, the last thing I wanted to go back on, we talked about potentially a revolution in football and if fans want 50 plus one ownership, which is never going to happen, but they're going to have to set up a new league system, a new FA, all those sorts of things, a complete breakaway, complete move away from traditional structure and pyramid and everything like that. I flouted the idea on Twitter a little while ago about raising a resolution against us entering the B-team competition, the Football League trophy, whatever the sponsorship name is. It's Papa John's trophy, is it now called? Yeah, that's what it was last year, yeah. Yeah, so, and there were sort of some different opinions on it, but I think if we want, if we are serious about fan ownership and how important that is in fans having a say in their clubs, and to reference Chelsea, Chelsea have said that now every board meeting will have a supporter present for those meetings but i mean that's that's a signal to end all signals they're gonna have no influence whatsoever that's just to placate people that's bollocks to be honest with you Mm. Um, but if we have the model we've got and we want to be serious about these things and we want to protect the interests of football not just the interests of afc wimbledon we have to make a decision we have to make a choice and i would put forward a resolution and people say well that gets into trouble and we have to pay fines and all this i'm thinking well what are we Are, are we are we a fan what We've got the we keep praising our model and how important it is. Well, it's pointless if we don't take advantage of it and start to think about the things that we could champion. If we were to get promoted to championships, Stu, do you know what? I mean, I think I would miss loads of games because I flatly would be like, no, I'm not going to 12:30 kickoffs every other Saturday. I'm not going to 5:30 kickoffs every other. Saturday. I'm not going to Friday night kickoffs. It's ridiculous. And um, but we, we we sell ourselves out as we progress. We sell ourselves out and we move further away from this idea that we want to, what we want to be. And like I said to you, the money of the Premier League doesn't drop down, but the attitudes of it do and have, and, and we're guilty in that. So essentially my question is, would people, let's have a bigger sample of people now, would they support my resolution on refusing to play in that BT competition? I wouldn't have an issue with it at all. I think I would support you in that. I think it needs, I think it probably needs a whole fan movement. I think it needs... You know, like, you know, you're stronger in a you're stronger in a group than you are individually, aren't you? Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I, in a way, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. You know, you see South United, South End United fans now moaning about their ownership and stuff. But you know, let's not forget the reason we got B teams in that trophy was because the Premier League threatened to withhold the money, the uh, solidarity money, until we agreed to lose them in it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, you know, it was that bribe again, wasn't it? So the only way, the only way, I think. I would love football fans or football clubs to join together and go, do you know what? None of us are going to rent it for a season. They won't because it's, it's money, isn't it? And it's the problem, you know, it's like going, if you have a salary cap, everyone do the salary cap. If you're going to boycott a tournament, everyone do it because you don't want, you don't want half doing it because the other half would benefit from the extra money. You know, it's got to be, I think everyone's got to be serious about this rather than, you know, chasing the money because it's the root of a weevil. Uh, on, on that side, so I, me personally, no, I won't have an issue um, with um, dropping out of that. I know we get fined. I suppose from a resolution, you'd have to see who, how much would the fine be, and could we afford it? But principle wise, yeah, we should do. Yeah, if you had to, a vote, if you had a resolution put forward and a, a members vote on it, of course you'd have to do all the proper plan, all the proper research into it, all the um, correct methods, and everything would have to be costed, and you'd have to go the full pelt on it, so everyone's got the full argument in the round as it were but I mean why not ask the question and yeah the chase for money Stu we're, we're, we're all at it we're all as bad as each other we really really are we are and, that, and that's the thing isn't it um, you know again look at money Scunthorpe United I remember saying to you a couple of years ago Scunthorpe are, are spending seriously too much money yeah. you know the teams that they brought down to us if you remember were like how the hell are you affording that they couldn't <laughs> and yeah. now you're seeing so it, Clubs have got to be protected from themselves. So, you know, I know you said about Gary Neville um, previously, and I get what you're saying. And what I would say when I've listened to it, he did vote for the wage cap, which went against his thing. In terms of that. So I think, yeah, I think the principles he has are right. Um, and he's involved in the, the Root for Change, which is an organisation about, um, you know, external or independent regulation, because you sort of need it. You know, if you know, Chef Wednesday haven't produced accounts for the last two years, Reportedly, haven't paid wages. Uh, I think a couple months ago. But what you need is the EFL won't investigate that until a year later, and then it'll be pro- You sort of need independent regulators to go. Do you know what? We're going to check everyone's accounts. I don't know every quarter, and if you are seen to not be paying wages, then you'll get deducted points. Then, 
it sort of needs independent regulators rather than us managing ourselves. With things like that, though, is that football's job? If if a if a limited Shift Wednesday, if a limited company doesn't publish their accounts as they need to do every year, I'd imagine that's in that's causing an offence. Some I'm not a financial person, but surely that's there's legal things involved in that beyond football. If they're not paying staff, again, that goes beyond football. Surely that comes into a much bigger issue. Like who's actually yeah, questioning it, that? It does, but it's about it's about the um, fit and proper test for owners, isn't it? Um, and it's it's basically about not spending. You're right. If they own the company, they should be able to spend what they want to spend. But you know, you've got situations now where a lot of clubs don't own their ground. <laughs> you know, well, again, no, I was thinking I mean, Bourbon City. Yeah, I mean, that's Bourbon a... City sold their. I was thinking of Bourbon City's again. I'm, I'm becoming a bit of a financial freak, but I'm looking at how much how much money clubs are losing in the championship. Um, and I didn't realise Bourbon was sold their ground. So what Derby sold their ground? Yeah, you know, what actual. What assets do they have? It's like they're selling everything. I suppose what I'm saying about that is, is that football, either fans or regulations have got us, because these fans, these clubs are more than just businesses. You know, they're setting communities. Um, and we need to, I think we just need to protect them. But fans, unfortunately, fans don't react until it's too late because they're happy to take all the success. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it's all reactive. It's, we're all it's guilty of that, aren't we? We're all, guilty we're all guilty of that. Of that. Oh, we've got that player. We never go and go, can we afford it? <laughs> no one ever asks those that. questions. <laughs> no, one ever, no one ever asks those questions. But you're right, the B team, yeah. I would, if there's a resolution, I would say yes. did it's wonder, I know, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here, uh, listeners, and this is what we do when we just start talking over things and things come up. The other thing about the 50 plus 1% thing, because you've mentioned it there, sort of football, are, football clubs are community assets, they're not businesses. But at the crux of it, they are private businesses. They're limited companies. I like reading books. Do you think I should protest Waterstones and say, Waterstones, if it wasn't for me, the customer, no one would read any books. So therefore, sell 49% of your company to me. It's the same, it's the same logic to me. So again, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I think we get. I think people have lost their minds a little bit, and I, I and I said the other day the the Man United thing, I think, really has very little to do with football. I think there's it's more to do with lockdown, people being kept in, not being able to see football. They've got an ex- they're angry. They've got lots of things going on. They might have lost their jobs. They might be financially really in a hot, difficult place right now, mentally in a difficult place right now. They need an outlet for their anger. Oh look, multi millionaires slash billionaires owning my football club. That seems an appropriate outlet for my anger. Let me go and stomp my way, throw some flares, get into the stage and kick some doors down, release that pent up anger. But as you said earlier, come August, yep, season ticket, please. Here we go, Man City at home. Yeah, well, it's, 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 you know, look here, and I, I know we're sort of spending a bit more time. Is I think it's quite a big, I think it's quite an important subject. But you know, Spurs people were laughing, saying, "Well, how the hell are Spurs class as top six? Well, if you go to Spurs now, their stadium is yeah. immense. Now, Spurs fans, I don't think Spurs fans, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, I might be a bit naive here, but I don't think Spurs fans are going, I don't know if those, I don't know if those owners can afford that. I don't think we should have a bigger ground. They would go to that ground and be, and be rightly proud of that. But that yeah. don't come cheap. Again, Arsenal, you know, new stadium, wow. new owners. Mm-hmm. Liverpool, doing nothing before the Americans come in. Happy to take, you know, they were happy for the Americans to come in and spend the money they have, expensive, serious money. And now, all of a sudden, they were going, well, actually, you don't understand us. Well, maybe, maybe, none, maybe none of them understood each other, do you know what I mean? But the fans will always stay quiet when they're winning stuff. Yeah. If the owners understood them fair enough when they were winning the Champions League and winning the Premier League. Yeah. So, rein it in at the start when it doesn't. You know, don't be blinded. It's what I'm saying to you. Don't be blinded for the fact that you're winning things. Because down the road, if, you, if it all comes like it has now, comes to a head, it's too late now too late you know you need billionaires to take over these clubs mm. and I, you know if that happens i don't think a billionaire is going to come in and just spend pretty money they want to, they want something out of their company random question we've mentioned lots of football clubs that we dislike is there a club in the football league other than us that you can't just like that are kind of there like i'm not going to say luton for example that's a different thing you know a club that you've sort of got no affiliation with whatsoever but you just kind of like them yeah, there's a couple probably. Um, Plymouth. Um, I, I, I don't mind Plymouth, to be honest with you. Even though they were a bit big-time Charlies, 
I don't mind when they come down to us. I think if I was going to say a club, Cheltenham. Okay. I just think there's nothing to dislike about Cheltenham. Lovely part of the world. Not a big horse racing fan. <laughs> but if you go there, it's a lovely part of the world. Always look after you. Know, always look after you. Never had any problems at Cheltenham. Nice club. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm trying to think now. Into I don't like Bristol Rovers. Um, Pompey, I don't... Yeah, there's, there's not many clubs that I like coming down to our place, to be truthful. Do you know what uh, kind of... Like Plymouth, I'd agree, but Plymouth I've got a bit of an affiliation with because I used to... We'd go on holiday down there and been to Home Park many times and seen that ground completely transform from the first time I visited. Um, Rochdale. I like Rochdale. I've got no affiliation with them. I kind of just like Rochdale. Yeah, again, they don't really cause you any threat, do they? I know it sounds very really mm. horrible, but you, you tend, yes, you know, as football fans, you tend, you tend not to like teams that beat you too much. Yeah. Because, of course, you know, no one wants that. Um, I'm just looking through a league table at the moment, trying to think of any club. Um, I like Ipswich. Doncaster, because Doncaster, again, nice club, nice little, nice kit. Um, Kingstonian fan, secret Kingstonian fan. That's what it is. Kings Meadow has um, institutionalised you. That's what that's done. <laughs> Play nice football, but Joe, you know I'm looking for a league table, and not many other clubs. Like no, like Fleetwood. I've always got an issue with Fleetwood. Yeah, because Fleet was the only the only team I know that had a bigger scoreboard than a stack. Yeah, like and also, I, we are going all around the circles here, but I will never forget that Friday night in the in the semi final first leg at Fleetwood. Yes, um, we battered them, but Fleetwood only show the highlights from the home from their team. Yeah, they had nothing to show; they just kept showing the kickoff. They didn't Brilliant. do nothing in that half, and it was just like that. To me, it was like a big time Charlie. Um, you know, if you're going to show highlights, show highlights from both teams. Uh, yeah, so I never really liked Fleetwood from that from that time, really. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, we did go on a complete all over shop <laughs> on this week's podcast. You can um, tell football's interesting, can't you? Yeah, at the moment. Last little thing, Eric's Eric Samuelson, yes. to be clear. His book is in the club shop now and uh, is also available from other good news agents and bookshops and some rubbish ones as well. And um, yeah, I've, I've read the first 20 pages because there's a preview of it floating yes. about online. And um, we're, it seems to be pretty on the straight and narrow, really, from what I've heard and, and read about it so far. I think it's going to be a nice walk down memory lane, but anyone looking for some controversy or some new massive revelations i'm not sure it's going to be the book for you yeah i've got an order um so i know it's a, i know it's on the club shop but i've got an order to be delivered um i'm looking forward to it i, I didn't that's why I, I didn't really want any revelations or anything like that but i i am sort of just keen to for his perspective on on stuff that happened maybe not in league one league two days i'm more you know non-league days um because Non-league was just crazy, wasn't it? And I'm sure a lot of crazy things went on. I doubt if Eric knew most of them. So I think Eric's one of those, you know, straight-laced. Um, I don't think he got in too many parties with Danny Oakins and Noel Franklin to this world, do you know what I mean? Um, I'm sure he's... Not, he's what, not what I've heard. <laughs> so it's going to be straight-laced. You know, Eric is a financial person by trade. So it's going to be very straight-laced. Um, I think, if, yeah, do you know what? I, I don't mind. I don't mind these sort of books. I'm, it's interesting. I actually... Um, I've downloaded because I don't really like books because they take up space, which I know is a bad subject. You know, and you're going to probably. My wife has just looked at me as well. She loves books, not the digital version. Um, it's like I don't, a knife I, to my heart, Stu. I know it's just because I can't. If it's on my if it's on my iPad, then I can just it's just in one place, isn't it? Um, what, and I know very, <laughs> <laughs> what books are you reading where you're like one chapter's over by the radiator, the other chapter's by the kettle, the other one's <laughs> in the bathroom? Like what? <laughs> My wife has given me the evils because we've had this conversation many a time. Um, but yeah, do you know what? I've actually, I've got, so I've got three books to read. Um, one actual book would be the Eric, but it's not in digital format. I don't understand why that is. Um, and I've, I've downloaded Peter Crouch's new book, which I've already read a few. It's hilarious. Um, even in the first, even in the first chapter, even in the first chapter, it's hilarious. Peter Crouch talking about um, grounds, new grounds, and said that um, the best ground was a giant stadium when he had basically his own site, like a, a bathroom, a size of a bathroom as his dressing area. <laughs> nice. 
<laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, I've got that and I've also got um, on Living on a Hold Volcano, it. which is a manager book. I've got to ask, though, when he says the size of Arthur, I mean, that's, I'm not sure that's a quantifiable measure. What he said, he, he said, basically what he said is he, he it's, it basically set the standards when he played Prayer for England. It, it was a size of a, a regular bathroom. It was like a pod a chair in there. That was what they called. So, you know, what he was saying was, is that in a dressing room, you get put where you sit. You have your locker, you have your name on it, you have a picture maybe of when you've done well, do you know what I mean? That sort of etiquette. Um, and he was saying the old grounds were had character. So he was talking about um, going to Arsenal at Highbury. And he said it's the first time he ever realised that there was under, under floor heating, mm. uh, which is now, he said, common in most footballers' houses. I'm sure they are. Um, and he said it was just a touch of class. Um, and he said, whereas you went to Rotherham, the old ground Rotherham, you changed the port cabin and then walked across the road to the ground. It's really, it, Peter Crouch is so funny, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? In terms of that. So I've got that, I've got that, and I've got a book about managers, and um, I think it's, it's cool now, Living on Top of a Volcano, volcano, volcano. Um, and it's got the first story about Martin Link, um, mm. who had mental health issues as a manager. Mm. Yes. Uh, really, really, really interesting, um, basically about pressures on managers uh, and stuff like that. So I've got loads to read for the summer. Uh, but Eric's will be the very factual, I don't expect... Eric's to be a, as a barrel laugh as Peter Crouch's book. I'm just kind of hoping Eric would randomly interspense his book with, um, intersperse even his book with top 10 lists of like top 10 worst players I signed or top oh. 10 worst fan conversations, top 10 most exciting Don's Trust meetings, all these sorts of things. Because I could imagine top, like, yeah. Top 10 worst ever deals given, top 10 three-year contracts given out yes top 10 insults i heard directed at liam trotter anyway let's move on in fact that is pretty much it for this week and that is us done so thank you very much listeners for joining us we are playing lincoln away gutted we can't go that was a highlight of the calendar for two seasons now and we've not managed it so hopefully they don't go up so we can do it next season but updates will be back on Twitter at Nine Wires Podcast in a week for the final game of the season. We'll be back next week. So, Stu, thank you very much for joining me this week. Thank you. Alexa Bliss, bag first, milk last. Two plus two equals four. And we will speak to you again next Friday.